Hello, hello, hello. We are here. We are live. This is Talk With Sports and Exercise Scientists and Physiotherapists. Um, my name is Charlie um, and you're here with ACU and a whole lot of uh, amazing people here that we're going to talk to you about a whole lot of different interesting things in this uh, industry. So welcome. Firstly, um, I can see there's some people here. Um, so we're just going to keep ripping on. Um, how this webinar is going to work is that I, uh, Charlie, I'm the facilitator, so I'm going to ask questions to these beautiful people we've got here. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions along the way, and you'll do that by using the live chat function in this webinar. Um, some of the questions will be answered on the back end um, by our good friends, Simone and Paige. They're going to be moderating. So some of those questions that, you know, Nick can be answered straight away. They'll nip it in the bud there on that chat and respond to you directly. If you have any specific questions for the panel, you can specify that in your question and those questions will be put through to me and I will ask the panel those questions so that we can get them answered. Uh, all right, um, this webinar will go for the next 45 minutes. Um, hopefully we'll be wrapping up before seven o'clock. Um, now we'll take this opportunity for all of the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, so we'll start with Charlie. Hi guys, I'm Charlie. I graduated from ACU in 2017, so I'm in my third year out. I did a Bachelor of Physiotherapy um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, next, Rihanna. Hi guys, I'm Rihanna. Um, so I did uh, a Bachelor in Exercise and Sports Science at ACU and graduated in 2018 and then went on to some further study. So yeah, that's me. And uh, Nick? Uh, yeah, so I did a Bachelor of Exercise Science with Honours, graduated in 2014 um, and then went on and did a industry-based PhD, which I graduated from in 2018. So a couple of years ago now, um, and yeah, just been working since. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Tom. Uh, I'm in my third year of physiotherapy. So any probably uni-related questions or course-related questions, you'll probably get the answers from me. And should we go back to Ryan and see how we're going? No, no dice there. That's a that's a classic. Um, we'll, <laughs> we'll keep on working with that one. Um, but at first, what I'd really like to get you guys to do is we'll do that in the same order if you could summarize your career to date starting with Charlie. So when I graduated physio in 2017 in my first year out I worked in the hospital system so I worked in the public hospital St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney and I spent a year rotating around different areas of the hospital um, and then since then have moved into private practice where I see a range of different patients um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. That's what I'm doing now. Sounds good. Rihanna, what's your career been like? So after I graduated uh, my undergrad, I worked um, as a personal trainer, just at a community gym. I went the practical approach. Um, but at the same time, I was also doing my postgrad study of exercise physiology. Um, so I had that hands-on community sort of approach um, until I graduated from master's and then worked my second career. Awesome. And that's really interesting about the postgrad study. We might talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, Nick? Uh, yeah, so mine probably started in my honours year. Um, I did my research in baseball and coupled that work with Baseball Australia um, the first 18 months um, and then kind of finished that, decided I wanted to go on and do further research and get into my sports science PhD. Um, so I got an industry, like an industry-based scholarship for a PhD um, at the Brisbane Lions. Um, did that and then that's kind of rolled on to now the, um, being the head of sports science at the Brisbane Lions still. So it's kind of been, uh, been pretty good. Sounds good. Uh, we, it seems that we've lost Ryan there. He's left the room. He's probably just going to reboot his system and see how he goes. Ryan, join the room. Uh, uh, Tom, um, what's, your, what's your story? Yeah, so obviously I'm still a student, so I haven't really had a career yet. But I graduated school in 2016 and then I took a year off and lived and worked overseas. Um, so I got into physio and then deferred for a year. Um, and I, I got in with uh, some adjustment factors. So I used the school relationship scheme and 
got some good marks in, uh, in biology and English, which allowed me a, um, a lower entry ATAR, and that's how I'm here. That's awesome. Thanks. And let's see if we can get Ryan. Da -da -da. Ryan, we got you. Oh, can you hear me? That is music to my ears. So, Ryan, I'm just trying to um, get a summary of your career to date. All right. So, the next question I've got um, is I'm going to address this to uh, Rihanna first. What's a typical day in your job like? So, after my undergrad um, as a PT, my typical day would be um, general assessments. So, I would find a, a C client. Um, assess them for their functional capacity, see what they um, see what they want to get out of exercise and their goals, and then I would draw up a exercise plan for them uh, so they can follow it safely and accurately to achieve those goals. Um, and I would do that all day. And what sort of clients do you have? So, as an exercise and sports scientist, I would have mainly healthy. So um, the physios will know there is a difference between healthy and unhealthy. They would be people that don't have any sort of chronic conditions or um, injuries or anything like that. So just your general walk into the gym, I want to start exercising type of people. Okay, sounds good. All right, we'll move on to Nick. What, what does a day in the life of you look like? How's the season going? Um, yeah, uh, good? Uh, yeah, we've started not so bad since, uh, since we've gone back. But, um, you know, it be interesting to see what happens over the next few weeks with it. Um, but more so my day... Um, whether we're in pre-season or in-season, um, um, kind of two different significant we train so much. So if it's a training day, I kind of take care of all our, um, basically all our monitoring, both internal and external, um, all our conditioning. I run our conditioning program as well, um, which keeps me you know, pretty busy. Um, and then on non-training days, um, the boys are usually in the gym, um, so I look after most of the tech in the gym, so kind of recording and monitoring what, what we're doing, um, kind of all our strength testing, um, whether it's pure strength numbers or kind of the tech with the North Wall Grind Bar, um, any other uh, kind of stuff we use, so I'll take care of all of that. Cool, sounds good. And is it, is it true that um, these players can do the beep test twice? Uh, nah, not true. Not true. Ah, big miss. No. Um, Charlie, what's a what's a day in your life look like? Okay, so working in private practice, I um see, I guess, a range of healthy and unhealthy people walking in to the clinic. Um, I work in a in an area where we mostly just see general population. So we see a little bit of sports. We see a little bit of um. Yeah, just your general sort of everyday people coming into the clinic with lots of different injuries. Um, the clinic I work at specialises as well in Pilates and exercise rehab. So a typical day for me usually looks at around three hours of Pilates where we teach um, oh group God. classes or, you know, personal private classes or duet classes. Um, and then from there, the rest of my day usually is just seeing clients, so assessing clients, um, and treating, putting together exercise programs and sending them on their way. So that's usually my day. Okay, cool. Sounds really good. I actually have a question coming from Jonas, um, and this is a question for Rihanna. Um, what's the current demand for exercise scientists? Is it a growing industry and where's the focus? Yeah, so really good question. Um, I guess in terms of demand, um, it's definitely there. Um, it's such a growing, um, no, such a growing can... career. Sorry, uh, yeah, we can hear you, Ryan. Yeah, we can hear you. He's here. Fantastic. I downloaded Chrome. <laughs> you got to Wow, that, you just hacked into the matrix there. I love it. Um, <laughs> sorry, but, no. sorry, well, we'll get to you in a second, Ryan. You pipe down over there. Um, <laughs> Rihanna was just talking about whether or not exercise science is a growing industry. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So it is a growing industry. And I guess the good thing is that because there's so many pathways, having the basis of exercise and sports science, you can pick so many different things after that. Um, and then things you can go into are quite niche. Um, so you've just got to get those basic skills down. Um, but yeah, it is expanding and it is, um, it is interesting. Okay. Um, while we will take this opportunity now that we have Ryan here, which has just made my day. 
Um, can we just get a summary of your career to date? Well, I studied at ACU Brisbane. I graduated at the end of 2016, so I've been out for four years. Um, I worked purely in private practice, um, and one month ago, I moved into aged care. So that's um, what I know most about private practice, so I could be most helpful with questions about that. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, and what does a typical day in your job look like? So, um, yeah, I was thinking about this. I think uh, a big key thing is in a private practice setting, you'll do kind of two things. One is um, what you'd call like clinical billable time. So that's time like treating clients and making money, like, you know, as, as per the business. Um, obviously, I mean, that's the business perspective anyway. That's that's part of your time where you're generating some income for the business um, and providing, obviously providing excellent care. And then the other thing, Part of what you'll do is what you call like your admin time or your non-billable time where you do all the things like um, communicating with clients, doctors, all the things that don't generate income but you need to do to just assist with um, the clinical work that you do. So in some practice that, practices that might be like marketing, um, even, you know, pumping things online um, to help with getting clients in the door um, or just your doctor's letters and things like that. Um, and I've, I've found the split is usually, most clinics want it to be like an 80-20 split. So 80% of your time you spend treating clients and generating some income and using your skill, using your physio skills, and then the other 20% is doing the supporting stuff. Great, okay, and thank you very much for that and for catching us up. Uh, I've got a question here from Wenting, and it's a question for Rihanna, but I think you physios might be able to um, weigh in on this one too. Um, but the question, Rihanna, is what's the difference between physio and exercise physiologist? Yeah. Are we on the spot there? Such a common question. So thank you for asking. Um, so I guess the main difference that um, us exercise physiologists or EPs um, say is we are a hands-off approach. We will treat um, any condition that you've got. So we treat everything from kids right through to older age, cancer, um, neurological, anything. But we will hands off. So you do most of the work, but we provide um, that experience and the recommendations and guidelines. Whereas physios, as EP say, are hands on um, and they will diagnose and treat you, yeah, hands on. But physios, you go for it. Yeah, Charlie, can we get a perspective from you? From I mean, I thought that was a very good answer. I think um, physios are probably, I think, more so now trying to go a little bit more for a hands-off approach and give patients really good self-management strategies and ways that they can, um, I guess, cope with their conditions alone without needing really regular hands-on treatment. But I think definitely we do offer more of a hands-on approach to um, treating patients um, and getting them on their way. But yeah, I think they do have a little bit of crossover and that's, I think, a great thing. We often work with exercise physiologists. We make sure that you know, I'm often referring on to exercise physiologists for further rehab or further management. Um, so in my mind, I kind of, I think I've, a lot of people will come to see a physio, you know, in those initial stages of injury. And I think I look to my EPs and exercise physiologists as um, sort of a little bit further down the line where they can help manage them and get them on their way in that way and get them a little bit more active and they have very good exercise-based knowledge. So, yeah. yeah I mean, I have to take. say from personal experience, I have been through that of, from the physio first and then the exercise physiologist. So yeah. thank you. You guys saved my life. Uh, so <laughs> the next question is for Rihanna again um, from Chris. Oh, you're really under the pump here. Um, there is another, <laughs> there's a few here. Um, but so from Chris, Rihanna, what other places besides private clinics can you work within as an exercise physiologist? So as an exercise physiologist, we can work, um, like you said, private practice, and that would be um, with physios and, and all the other allied health. You can go into a community setting like I am, so that's uh, community gyms or um, uh, council-based practices. So that's um, you can sort of walk in and they're more subsidised, um, cheaper, uh, low socioeconomic status sort of areas. Um, you can go into hospital, either public or private, 
And on that, you can do an outpatients, so people that have already been in hospital and then they come into outpatients, or you can do on ward, uh, so physio comes in and sees them post-op and then you go in and give them more exercise. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different options. Um, yeah, there, there's some. Okay, awesome. Um, there's a lot of questions actually coming in from the audience, so we might answer a few more of those and then get on to the pre-arranged questions. These guys, um, you've been really put on the spot here and I'm appreciating it. Uh, the next one is for Nick from Rui. Uh, are there any opportunities if you want to work as part of a semi-pro or pro sports team? Um, would those organisations look for someone who has further education on top of just a bachelor's? Yeah, uh, yeah, good question. Um, uh, particularly professional sport, um, you think I'm, I'm based in Brisbane, um, so there's probably only a handful of people who work in a full-time role in professional sport in my job, um, doing what I do, so it's pro probably uh, a little bit limited um, in the professional space. Um, there are lots of opportunities um, in semi-professional spaces. Um, I started out the kind of in semi-professional sport with the with the baseball stuff, which kind of gave me a pretty good grounding because you you I guess you have a chance to generate more skill um, in terms of being able to to apply your trade um, with athletes, um, and you kind of need to to learn and to get better. Because because when you kind of go to, to professional sport, there's probably a little bit less um, room or margin for error um, and you're probably under the, the pump a little bit more to, to make right calls um, regularly where you can with how, you, how you're planning training or how you're planning certain loads or periodisation. It's probably a little bit more on the line in terms of, in terms of uh, financial cost for the club or, or success or things like that. Um, so there's lots of opportunity in semi-professional space, which I think is a good starting point. Um, and yeah, uh, lots of clubs now are looking for um, people with further education than just an undergrad. Um, yeah, I would say the majority of people who are working um, now in professional sport are either undertaking their PhD or finish their PhD. It's kind of yeah, just the nature of professional sport. With obviously, not there's not that many teams um, compared to maybe how many gyms there are, for example. Um, you kind of need stuff that sets you apart, I guess. Thank you very much for that. Um, I can see more questions coming in from the audience. I will get to those, but I've got um, one of my own that I want to throw in. Um, and this one is going to be for Ryan and Nick. Ryan, we can go you first. What are the opportunities and challenges in your profession? Oh, dear. We've, it's happened again, Ryan. It's happened again. Um, so, okay, Is that working? Yeah, it's working. Oh, I muted yeah. myself just in case I coughed or something. Yeah, yeah. You you're trouble, man. You're trouble. <laughs> okay. we, love you. we love you. What are the opportunities and challenges in your profession? Okay, so uh, that's a big question. I think uh, I, would say I would say opportunity. The opportunity is massive, um, but it depends on, I guess, what your goals are. Um, I would say... I would say the profession in physiotherapy, um, it's not really like there's not kind of one way to do something. There's a lot of different kind of approaches, perspectives. You'd even say like camps, um, a, a lot of a lot of different approaches to, to the same thing, which is fixing pain and injury. So I honestly see a big opportunity is trying to identify something that kind of unifies the profession a little bit more and consolidates the profession. So the, like really identifying a really like you'd almost say like best practice that would um, help people to really like help yeah identify best practice to kind of bring people together. That that's my opinion. I think there's there's a lot of camps and approaches that could be yeah unified. So that's kind of like a big picture one. I think. Um, what do you think of that answer, Charlie? Is that a bit too philosophical? Yeah. No, no, it's a good answer. I guess like the other oh, thing with physio is um, just like the opportunity to work in like a million different areas. You know, you've got your private practice setting, but you can go into public hospital, private hospital. You can specialise in women's health or men's health. You've got the opportunity to work with kids and work in a paediatric setting. Um, the opportunity, obviously, to work in a sports practice or work with professional sports teams or amateur sports teams. I think like there's just opportunity in general 
to go in so many different directions. That would be my biggest thing as a, like trying to decide what you want to do. I think physio has so many avenues that you can go down and they all present lots of different challenges and lots of great, great things about them as well. And then what about the challenges? What's challenging? Just give maybe one nugget from everyone, I reckon. Yeah. I would say... I also, go Ryan first. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I honestly found a challenge for me was um, uh, I found working and learning was a challenge for me. So when, when you're at university, you're, you can put all of your energy into learning. And when you come out of university, I think it's realistic to expect that there's going to be a lot more learning to do. And you need to um, be able to organise yourself so that you can do that while you're working. So there's going to be work demand and you still want to strive to connect the dots and problem solve to keep learning as well. So just it's probably realistic to expect that and that challenge. Nice. Um, Charlie, what's the challenge? Yeah, Ryan's answer was really great. I guess for me it's um, working. we're working with people predominantly. So you're going to come across lots of different people with lots coming from lots of different backgrounds, people you don't click with, people that you click really well with, and I guess learning how to um, communicate well with anyone but also to know that it's okay that some people just <laughs> you're just not going to click with and that's that's normal and that's fine and some people are going to be easy to work with and some aren't. So I guess just learning um, to communicate as well as you can all the time but don't be disheartened if, you know, sometimes things don't go as well as you want. Rihanna, what's the challenge for you? Um, yeah, so like the other two said, it's it's having that adversity thrown at you and having to deal with it. So seeing um, any sort of injury or any sort of um, person, personality, it, it just gets thrown at you and you don't have time to think. You just have to run with it and, and trying to learn that on the fly is, is hard, but you do get better. Yeah. Awesome. And Ryan, what's the, what's the biggest challenge for you? Oh, no, Ryan, sorry, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so probably, probably similar, but maybe a, a different one um, that I feel maybe a little bit more specific um, to sport but could still apply is we probably feel that in kind of in sport you always want to try and be innovative or cutting edge or you, you always want to look for the new thing, whereas that's not necessarily always the, the best. Um, kind of a lot of the time it's really difficult to, to stick to kind of your big rocks like your, your basic things that you know are tried and tested and you know that are based in theory and a sound practice. I think it can be hard to, to kind of stay grounded with that, um, particularly when kind of you have coaches around you or you have players trying to, to get you to push things all the time. Um, you need to make sure that what you're doing, you're doing your big things right and then you can maybe sprinkle the sand on top um, when, when you've got those big things right, but just try and stick true to, to what you know and, and back that in and do it consistently because that's what will give you success over the long run. Great. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to return to some questions because they're banking up from the audience and thank you, audience, for being so engaged. Uh, the next question I have is for Charlie from Kayla. Um, moving forward, do you think physio or exercise physiology has greater growth? in regards to job availability, research, and other developments. Really oh, on the spot wow, there. Wow, you've really got me there. Look at the uh, rumble look. with the Jets. <laughs> I think that both professions are, gro are growing. Healthcare is, like, one of the best professions you can go into. I think even right now during everything we've gone through with this COVID crisis, I think healthcare, again, it's just been exemplified about how important it is. You know, people get injured, people get hurt, people... They need professional advice and healthcare is always going to grow. Um, in terms of job opportunities, I mean, I haven't worked as an exercise physiologist, um, so I can't really answer for that. But in terms of physio, you know, there's a great job opportunity out there. There's plenty of jobs. Um, and as long as you work hard and you, you know what you want, I think then you're going to work towards that goal. And so... In terms of job opportunity and development, I think it's really up to up to us as as professionals and going into a career um, to provide that growth because that's the only way it's going to grow. Is the more people in it, the more it's going to grow. In terms of research and development, I think research and development is coming out all the time. 
there's new research as as even Nick stated before um you know you're constantly want to, wanting to try new things because there's constantly new things coming out so I think regardless of um opportunity I think both create great opportunity for research and development and they cross over really nicely so I think um both are great opportunities for career choices okay thanks for that I'm going to move on to the next question um it's for Ryan from Pearl how would you describe the responsibilities of a physiotherapist hmm. so speaking from a private practice setting the responsibilities of a physiotherapist I think um so I would say it's I'm just thinking about like my mind kind of goes to the role you start to play um in the room with, with a client so I think really your responsibility is just to meet the expectations of the client and every client's expectations are different. So I think it's your responsibility probably mostly to communicate well and identify their goals, their expectations, get the information that you need to do, to work with and do a good job. Um, I guess, if, yeah, so I would say that's probably the biggest one. If everyone's expectations will be different. Some might come in and say, yeah, like, might be totally committed and say, I want a 12-week plan on whatever it takes to understand my body better and know how to move well for the long term so I won't have pain and injury. I want, that's what I want. That would be a great client, but often they don't say that. Often they just say, you know, my expectations are I'm, I'm in pain and I just want to back rub and do whatever you want to do to fix it. So I think your responsibilities, in a, in a sense, it just varies with each scenario. But probably overall, it's know what they want and deliver with whatever, like use whatever you have and do your best job with it. I'd say that's your responsibility. You can't expect yourself to know everything, but you've just got to do your best job with the knowledge you have and then know how to learn more, I'd say. Cool, 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 cool. Um, Tom? I've got a question for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. Um, so this is from Macria. Uh, as an undergraduate physiotherapy student, how many contact hours should you expect at uni and how do placements work? Okay. Um, I probably can't give you an exact figure of how many contact hours there are, but it's definitely more than your standard degree. Um, you've got lectures, which you, can, you don't have to be at the uni for. But on top of that, you've got your tutorials. And then on top of that, you've got your pracs. And that pretty much goes for all of your four units that you'll be doing uh, every semester. So it is likely you'll be at uni minimum three, four, up to five days a week. Um, that's, not, that's not a full day. Um, but it would definitely be a few hours every day. Um, pracs run for two hours as well. And that will be the same for all of your units. Placements are uh, really good to use on them very, very well. So you will start placement in your first year, you do an observational. Um, you go out to a hospital, I went to St. Vincent's, and you go around, you do 30 hours, I think, of observational. Second year is really fun, you do your sports placement, so you go to a sports club um, or, or a team. I went back to my old school, Joey's, where the rugby is quite big, so I went and did uh, my placement there. And I actually got a job out of it afterwards, which is amazing. Um, so with that, third year, you go and teach uh, school kids about um, spine health and like how to take care of themselves. And then four, fourth year is the big one. You do six five-week blocks of uh, placement. So you'll do, I think it's three compulsory. You'll just be sent to hospitals. Uh, in different wards, so you'll be covering musculoskeletal, cardio, respiratory, and neurological, and then you get to kind of pick three electives. So that's when you can kind of do, I want to do pediatrics, or I want to do sports, or um, or geriatrics, aged care. So yeah, and it's integrated very well from a very uh, from just from first year. So yeah, thanks, Tom. You get, you get the idea of it early on. Awesome, thank you. Uh, the next question from Prakar is for Nick. What's the best way to gain experience during university? Uh, yeah, so is this in terms of getting into sport or in terms of kind of just experience? Well, 
You're, yeah, we would like your perspective on sport and getting yeah, into yeah. sport. No worries. Um, and we'll get a physio example as well. After. Yeah, so I think uh, you, you probably want to be careful with how I phrase it, but lots of undergrads um, and people getting into sport um, kind of get their foot in the door through volunteer um, work is probably the first point when you don't really have a skill set to work with and you probably don't have much to offer. Um, being able to get in there on a volunteer basis to kind of get a bit of an idea of how things work and how the whole thing comes together. That was probably the thing that I, um, uh, if I had my time again as an undergrad, would would have liked more of a grasp of. I think at uni you learn lots of different things individually, um, but particularly in sport you don't get a full picture of how the whole thing comes together. So for me, I work quite, quite closely with S&C guys um, and physios and medical so kind of you have all these independent um, bits of knowledge, but you don't have that the whole picture. Um, so kind of getting into a sport club, whether it be professional or semi-professional, um, I think it's probably irrelevant in the early days. Um, but, yeah, get, getting in there. Um, I even I have kind of like sports trainer roles um, I think are, are quite good, um, and particularly if you want to follow on and get a career. Um, I know most, um, yeah, the majority of sporting clubs would hire people that they already know if that makes sense that not too many people um, are getting jobs through advertisements to, to work in sport teams they typically go through word of mouth um, and you probably the, the job adverts don't necessarily see the light of day in, in lots of cases so it's important to to kind of show your face and and kind of turn up and and just do what you say you're going to do really yeah that's really good advice and i think in today's day and age everyone thinks they're going to jump on linkedin and uh seek and everything like that but um you've got to net start network networking that's really good advice um the can i just also get um an example from physio maybe from um from you charlie um are there opportunities out there for you know to be a physio assistant for students to get experience while they're studying yeah, definitely. So hospital, public hospital systems have um, physio assistant roles that always come up. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, then um, that's definitely something you can do. So public hospitals, um, I'm pretty sure there's private hospitals do the same thing. And as a physio student, they really like to take um, you on in those roles. Uh, as Nick said before, like any any experience that you want or opportunity that you want you really have to be forthcoming i think that's what i've learned the most of since graduating is if you want something or you have this goal it's not just going to fall into your lap um i did some volunteer stuff at the sydney swans in my second year i did i worked for as a sports trainer for a NEFL team from second year all the way through to fourth year i mean you really do have to like give yourself these opportunities and i think unfortunately sometimes they come in a volunteer role um and sometimes they're paid it it just depends but yeah i think you know if you have real goals for what you hope to do in your career you have to put yourself out there and contact people and network and give yourself the opportunity okay sounds yeah. good thank you um next question is another one more, more a procedural one for you tom i don't do chemistry as an elective and was wondering how much chemistry is involved in completing a physiotherapy degree or exercise physiology. I understand you, you may not know about exercise physiology, but your physio, what chemology you know, and does it mostly centre around biochemistry? Uh, you'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. You won't have to worry Zero. about chemistry at all. Zero and at, at, at most like one lecture of in the first semester. You'll be fine. So what is the science requirement? Uh, we have to do any science, uh, but I would say biology helps the most, but it's not, definitely not necessary. Plenty of people don't do bio and they get they do very well. Um, yeah, you'll be, you'll be fine. I wouldn't. I saw you that. nodding there, Rihanna. Um, does that apply for your exercise physi physiology path as well? Yeah, so um, not so much ex phys, but ex and sports science. I didn't do chem either. Um, I didn't have a requirement for a science. I thought I did when I was in year 12 as well and panicked in my year 12 and went, oh, I have to do bio. Turned up first year exercise and sports science and basically did year 12 bio all over again in my first sem. And then for exercise physiology, we do 
uh, anatomy advanced one, two, three, and four, and I didn't need science at all. You learn it at uni if you desperately need it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, while we've got you, Rihanna, I'm gonna direct my next question to you. Um, what would be the biggest myth or misconception in your industry? Um, I guess as exercise and sports science, it's that you're just a trainer. Um, there, as we've heard, there's a big difference between sports trainers, personal trainers, and then exercise and sports science students. They are three very different roles. Um, so if you've got the undergrad experience, then use your undergrad experience. And then as an exercise physiologist, the big one is that I am just a physio or I am a physio, um, which we covered before. They are very different. Um, so just knowing your role and, and knowing what comes under your care as a professional is the biggest myth. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm going to also ask this question to Nick, and that's because we do get students, um, you know, the dream job, you know, go and working for a a major sports team or um uh yeah socceroos or something like that you know what what's a big misconception about working for the pros uh yeah um oh, probably the, the biggest one that the people don't realize is how much time i would actually spend um kind of at my computer looking at data or, or information is probably one that that I didn't quite have a grasp on when i first got into it um kind of my my role is Yes, we, we do a lot of hands-on stuff with training and in the gym, but lots of it re revolves around collecting data or collecting information to guide kind of future decisions around what, what we want to do. Um, so you spend lots and lots of time collecting information, kind of synthesising information and then kind of actioning or, or making plans based off that, that info. So I spend a fair bit of time um, outside of training hours kind of at, at the computer um, going through doing um, oh, like lots of programming languages, um, lots of different skills I probably didn't think I needed um, as a sports scientist, but probably have really helped um, be able to be efficient in, in my role. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's a big one. And we don't just get to keep the footy around all the time either, unfortunately. Do you get to kick the footy around at all? Uh, yeah, I try. I try to get involved where I can. Um, and Ryan, what's, what's the misconception about? Being a physio? I think probably I'm thinking of misconceptions that clients have when they come in, and I'm talking about private practice. Um, so big big misconception would be that um, say when you go through physio school, you get tools that you can use to magically fix someone. That would probably be a misconception. That's not true. Um, in most cases. Um, so what you really have to do is um, I guess, you know, there's, there's hands-on techniques that you can do that help with pain, but that goes hand in hand with um, some movement therapy that, you know, to build capacity, strengthen the pain conditioning stuff to help them along the way. So often clients come in and they're thinking that you're going to do something to them and that's going to make them feel better, which is true, but it's not the whole story. So there's kind of this, um, and you call that like a passive therapy. So people think that physios do a lot of they kind of just see physio as a passive therapy. I go there, they do something to me, it's up to them to fix me, whereas really it's more of a partnership. Um, I would say that's a big one. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is for everyone. Um, so we'll go around, I'll, I'll just do it one at a time, but how do you know if the job you know, or the, your field is right for you? Charlie, how, how would someone oh, know if physio is right for them? Uh, I think if you have an interest in the human body, that's pretty vital. Um, interest interest in how the body works. Um, I think having an exercise interest really helps. So having a little bit of interest in sport and a little bit about how um, the types of people that are coming to you. I think if you don't really have much interest in exercise, it's going to be really hard to convince someone um, that that's important really um if you're interested in helping people i mean that's pretty much what we do as a profession we're always helping people and trying to get the best out of someone and in order to do that we have to yeah you have to want to help people and have that experience i think having empathy and just being a generally happy 
nice person is also helpful. So if you um if you really want a career where you're working with people all the time and you're listening to the concerns and worries of other people, I think if that's something that you can feel or see yourself doing, then physio is a great career um, for you. Great. Rihanna? Um, yeah, I think Charlie said that really well. Um, same as exercise physiology or exercise science, um, knowing that you're there to help people um, and and put them on a path of, of a better them um, is what we like to say. Um, but knowing that you're also going to have more than just your role, so being able to deal with um, being part therapist and being part mum, being part, you know, a professional like everything there's there's so many different roles you have to take um and knowing that you can deal with that i think is a good start but ultimately you, you're not going to know until you're in it i self-doubted myself for the past sort of six-ish months um, and i still love what i do so you're never going to know truly until you're right in the thick of it great ryan oh that's a mute as well um, can you just, what exactly is the question again? Uh, so, yeah, that's right. We, um, the question is, how do you know if, if physio is right for you? The right field. Um, I would say maybe some practical advice is really early on, like there's lots of content online that you could get lots of exposure to what it's like to be a physio really early on. And do that really early, like before you're in fourth year of physio or have graduated and worked for two years. Do as much research as you can to answer that question for yourself. So I would say one option is, and I'm speaking about private practice because that's where I've gone into, you can shadow in clinics. You can reach out. You can reach out to any clinic in any, like, I mean, any clinic that you know and just ask them, like, could I just come in for an afternoon and see what it is that you actually do? And they may just say, yeah, fine, like, just come in. And you may even get to sit in in some sessions and watch what the physio does with the client and see, see three of those go by. And then that would be a really helpful thing for you to see. And they go, oh, I like that or that was weird. That wasn't what I was expecting. I'll do it differently. Just see what impression it makes on you. I think that would be a good thing to do. Or also um, there's lots of amazing information online like podcasts, um, Instagrammers who are physios. Of, um, maybe that's not really a realistic representation of what it's like. But I'll just say get heaps of information, make that decision for yourself. But you need, I would say you need grit, Resilience, um, don't give up kind of attitude and it helps if you like problem solving and it helps if, yeah, if you like helping people. Great. Uh, Nick? Yeah, ditto a lot of the same answers. It's At the end of the day, we're just helping people. We have a, a specialised skill set to help in, well, in sport, in, in human performance and you're trying to help these people attain peak performance to be able to perform on, on a game day. Um, that's kind of what you're there for. Um, and a big one in sport particularly is I think people get caught up in like professional players being kind of on a pedestal and being these kind of super special beings, um, but they're not really. They're people just like you and I who have, who have fears, who have um, lots of doubts about themselves, who have lots of issues just like we all have those same thoughts and insecurities and so you're just trying to help them out um in your area and you kind of yeah it's just a partnership kind of thing you just you're just helping them and, and they're just people just the same as, as rihanna says people um it's exactly the same you're just trying to to help them just get a bit better at what they want to do yeah i'm really loving all these perspectives because they're all different but they're quite heartwarming and what about from a student perspective tom so you're about halfway through how do you know that, you know, why, why haven't you dropped out yet? <laughs> like, how do you know that it's right for you? Yeah, well, pretty much exactly the same as what everyone else said. Uh, you want to help people, really. Um, I, I actually initially applied to be a paramedic, to be paramedicin, but I was like, oh, it's not for me, so I love physio. Um, yeah, just being empathetic and wanting to help people be a better version of themselves, I guess. Um, but one thing I kind of wish I knew um, well, I didn't know about physio. Is I think a lot of people think that physio is just like the private practice sport musculoskeletal, which is a massive part of physio. But I didn't even know that there were cardiorespiratory physiotherapists who work in hospitals and ICU wards. 
I didn't know there was neurological physiotherapists. So just being aware of all the different avenues that you can you can go down as a physio. Cool. Uh, I like the sound of all those different avenues, um, though I don't know really know what you're talking about. But that's you know, you know I'm not I'm not a physio and I'm not going to be one. So um, any of you guys, you can Google some of those things and see what Tom was talking about. Uh, so I've got a question for Charlie from Ariel. How would you describe being a physio in a hospital? What was that like? Oh, amazing. I loved it. Um, I think the hospital experience was obviously very different to um, anything that I imagined. So I was pretty similar to Tom. I think I kind of knew that there were physios, but in a hospital setting, but I didn't really know what their job was. Um, so in my first year out, we rotated. Um, so I spent about two months in each rotation and I did six different areas of the hospital. So I worked in ICU. I worked in a stroke or neurological rehabilitation setting. I worked on the geriatric ward, the neuro ward, orthopedics. So, you know, I was very much like, I saw pretty much everything that you could possibly see in the hospital setting. Um, what I will say just to like, just to make sure you guys have a pretty well-rounded view um, is that yeah. I don't want to turn any of you away, but I do find that in the hospital setting and, and in physio in general, like career progression occurs quite early, you know, like you come out of the hospital setting and your job is, it doesn't change all that much in terms of your expectation. So the expectation is always the same from a new grad to, you know, your senior physios. There's what you have to do and your job description in terms of clinical work is very much the same. So that would be my only thing. Um, but it's just interesting because you get to see so much variety. So that was my favourite thing about it. You know, you really got to see the really unwell to like an outpatient setting where you're just, you know, doing sort of similar stuff to private practice. Um, so, yeah, I think the variety of it was so great. And just the hospital setting is so fun. You're working with a lot of different people. You're interacting with allied health teams, doctors, nurses. You're learning a lot about medical conditions. So in that sense, I think it was a really fun experience and definitely something that I'm like still open to doing and still do actually work casually um, in that setting. So, yeah, I think I really enjoyed it and it's definitely a great path to go down. Great. Thank you very much. Um, quick question, Ryan and Nick. Um, we'll go Ryan first. Um, this is from Harleen, and it's what's your work timing like? What hours do you do? So um, I was working in a private practice where I was, yeah, so I was doing 35-hour weeks um, in my last private practice job. Which, Monday to Friday? Yeah, Monday, Monday to Friday. But it was a bit split. Like uh, I had like a my two long days were the Tuesday and Thursday, and they were like ten hour days. And then I had like a really short, you know, like a, a, the Monday and Friday were like five hour days, and then Wednesday was kind of in between. And um, so that was my experience um, prior to that. Um, it was something similar in another position. I find in private practice physio, it's generally not just like a nine to five job. I think a lot of the private practices try to catch people before and after work. So you might find in the real world that you're doing shifts that finish at 7 p.m. or start at 7 a.m. And you, and you might have a shift that goes from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. perhaps one day and then another day, you know, it's, I, I think it varies a lot in between clinics. Um, that was my experience. Great. And Nick, what's your work hours like? Uh, yeah, so again, Probably different. We have two main phases of the year we're in. We're either in pre-season, um, where we're kind of the main focus is, is training and we want to develop physical qualities. Um, so we train a lot. Um, so that's typically six days a week and you're probably looking at maybe 50 to 60 hours a week um, during pre-season. Um, yeah, so it's quite, pre-season is a really demanding time for, for lots of us, um, but then when we shift to in-season, so like what we're in at the moment where we, we play kind of the, the main shift changes from building physical qualities to more of a maintenance and a kind of a recovery focus. Um, so you kind of more so um, working on getting guys up from week to week. Um, so the commitment is a little bit less, um, although you have to, to travel with the team. So 
Um, obviously, there's a, some weekend work involved um, and you kind of go wherever the team goes. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit busy, um, but has its good, has its good parts, has its, uh, has its bad parts. I thought I'd just throw in quickly. A lot of private practices, you do work weekends, so just be prepared for that. And also, even in the hospital setting, you're often rostered on to, to work weekends as well. So Night in shift? physio there. Pardon? Night shift for physios or...? Yeah, I, I mean, it depends on the hospital that you work at. So my my night shift was in, until like 10 p.m. and then on call. So it kind of depends, um, a hospital to hospital. But there is that potential in the in your first year out that you will have to um, work night shifts and weekends. Definitely right. in private practice. Yeah, private practice. My first job, I worked a Saturday. So if yeah. you're a new grad, you probably work a Saturday in a private practice. <laughs> Okay, um, this is a question for everyone. Um, I mean, it can be even for you, Tom. Uh, but, um, what was your experience finding a job after you graduated uni? Let's just get like a really short one because we're getting close to time here. We've got still a few more questions to get through. So just a short summary of your experience finding a job. Um, we'll start with Charlie. So I apply in Sydney. Um, the hospital process is you basically do one application and then you list all the hospitals that you would like to work at and essentially you get ranked and then you get a hospital, hopefully. That's the hope. Um, so, yeah, I got a job through that. So I didn't really have to apply as such. I just did one application to all the hospitals around New South Wales. Uh -huh. um, and then once I finished Sounds up like my nursing. allocation year, yeah, similar to nursing, yeah. Once I finished up my allocation year, I then went um, and looked for a job in private practice and I pretty much um, just kind of found one that suited what I was looking for and what I wanted to achieve. And it, I got, I guess I got lucky. It was the first job I applied for and I got that one. So I've never really had any issues. Um, yeah, okay. there's lots of jobs out there. Okay, Rihanna, how, what was your experience after graduating finding work? Um, so after undergrad, um, there was heaps of jobs I was looking for personal training so there was heaps of jobs for that um, I didn't want to go research or anything so I was pretty lucky first like Charlie first one I applied for I got and then after master's grad um, kind of a bit more difficult but um, and I was pretty lucky first three I applied I got interviews for and then it was just pick sort of which domain you wanted um, but uh, again, for uh, ex phys, um, it depends if you want to go part time, casual, full time. And um, heads up, if you want to go part time, get in really early. They're they're very limited, so um, you might have to do a couple of part times. But yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Ryan, what was your experience like finding finding a job? I I am involved in the church and I knew someone at the church who knew someone who was a physio who owned his own business and I figured out probably second semester in fourth year that I wanted to go into private practice rather than hospital and so I went and approached my friend who knew someone who owned a private practice business and I said, can you introduce me to your friends? And he did and I volunteered I, a couple of Saturdays. I went along and shadowed at that clinic um, he, he allowed me, um, this fellow allowed me to come along and see what he does and help out. And through that, through that, I handed in a resume and got that job. So I put most of my eggs in one basket because I knew what I wanted to do and had that connection. Um, I applied at hospital as well, but they rejected me. Um, I, oh, don't worry, Ryan. But I, I got the private practice job anyway and another um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Got to know what you want. And Nick, how'd you go? Uh, yeah, mine wasn't too bad. Um, kind of because I did the industry-based PhD, I was kind of embedded in the in the club anyway. Um, so I was working. Yeah, I was basically doing the job while I was doing my PhD. So that was kind of my gateway to get in. Um, and then from there, that's just kind of transfer, transformed or morphed into the role. Now, um, probably, but I don't think I would have got to look in for the job if if it wasn't for kind of the, the connection that I'd built through that time um, because particularly our organisation doesn't really um, promote any new jobs externally really. Um, lot, lots of it is word of mouth and um, kind of if you, if you are a little bit in the know or or you kind of have something going for you, they, they might look to you before they look to other candidates. So I managed to get pretty lucky like that. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, and yeah, there you go. 
So I've got another question coming in from Harleen. This is for Charlie. What do physiotherapists actually do? <laughs> Can you please elaborate on what a patient session looks like? We haven't well, I guess it kind of depends exactly what um, area you're looking. In the hospital setting, it's very much you assess, check their notes, see what they've come in for. Um, most of the time in the hospital, your aim is to just get them up and get them moving. So get them walking, make sure they're safe walking, if they need crutches, if they need a walking aid, any of that sort of thing. Um, a lot of our aim in the hospital is about discharge. So it's about getting them out of the hospital pretty much as soon as they're safe to do so. In private practice, um, usually you will see a client come in, you sit down with them, have a chat about what their issue is. So usually they're, say they've hurt their back, you know, they were out in the garden, they've bent down to pick something up and they've hurt their back. We ask them a lot of questions and then we assess their movement, we assess their strength, we assess any neurological things. Um, and all of this you learn at uni, so don't be freaked out by everything we're saying. Um, and then from there, you kind of pick your treatment. So your treatment depends on on your assessment and the exact techniques you use will depend on what their assessment looked like. Um, and then from there, you just develop a plan really. So it's kind of whether you need to see them again. Yeah, I, it's kind of hard to explain succinctly, but basically you assess them, you treat them, and then you formulate a plan to get them going cool thanks for that it does sort of bring back memories of when i went to the physio and it was this older dude and he had a bow tie so i saw that immediately i thought oh this guy's a bloody dinosaur but um, <laughs> uh, um he got me doing these bad boys up against the wall does that sound like something you might <laughs> do yeah we definitely occasionally do that oh, these bad boys they're good yeah <laughs> can i add that charlie yeah yeah um i think that was a really good explanation maybe the maybe the <clears throat> Something to tie that together is at university you'll come along a concept called a clinical reasoning process, which just means like a, a problem solving process. Um, and usually at university you you learn like an acronym probably called SOAP, which is stands for subjective, objective, assessment, and then plan. So this is the, these are the steps that you're going to take with a client in front of you, whether it's in hospital or in a private practice setting, to help to like help to manage them, help to manage their complaint and give them a good result. So um, <clears throat> like Charlie said, it's initially it's asking questions and gathering information in order to come up with a bit of a hypothesis about what's happened to them and what's wrong with them. So you want to find a diagnosis and then you're based on that, I guess, and, and do also doing objective like assessments. So like Charlie mentioned, you're looking at the way that they move, the range of movement and all of these things. And then you're, um, based on that information, giving them a treatment plan. So as a physiotherapist, what you're going to do is you can do hands-on treatment. So you can press on things that are sore or tight or stiff and, and see what effect it has. So that's like your manual therapy techniques. And then you also prescribe exercises. So that's more your movement therapy, um, movement therapy interventions in order to like that, that that's a movement therapy um for a reason you're not going to give things for no reason you've got to give things for a very specific purpose in order to achieve a good result that you've identified in that process so the clinical reasoning process is what you need to really understand and then you'll add heaps and heaps of content and information to that as you gain experience cool that's it's so interesting to hear what is going on behind uh you know from a client's perspective there's just so much to it um we're, we're running a little short on time so we might just um wrap it up with one final question and uh, we will start with you tom because we haven't heard from you in a little while um and, but we'll get an answer from everyone and then we'll call it a day uh what um would be your little nugget of advice for anyone considering entering into your profession um so getting into physio uh, a lot of people especially if you're in Sydney and looking at ACU, look at the ATAR and think, oh, my God, that's impossible. It's not. Um, you know, I think it's 97.5 is next year's ATAR cutoff, but don't be, don't, you know, don't be scared by that. There's a lot of adjustment factors out there, so depending on what school you go to and depending on how well you do in your HSC, you can really bring that mark down. And the other one, if, you're, if there's anyone in, like, year 10 or year 11 watching, 
when you kind of pick your subjects, don't pick a, don't pick HSE subjects based on what you think will be good for your uni degree. Pick what you enjoy and pick what you're good at because that's what you'll do the best in and will get you the, the best mark. You'll, in school, you'll enjoy school a lot more too. Okay. Great. I have just got a word from our moderators that we're going to we're going to close off now. Um, but um, for the lot of you, thank you very much for being here today. I'm I'm sure that the students, um, the potential students, ha had a lot of good insights from you, and I'd like to personally thank you on behalf of ACU and all of you um, alumni. Thank you so much for being here and, and sharing all of those stories. I really appreciate it, and um, we'll hopefully see you again sometime. And for the audience members, thank you again for coming here. And uh, if you have any more questions, um, you can always contact our Ask ACU Centre. All righty. Thanks very All right. much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.